Yeah. All right. Okay, we're going to talk about complexity theory. Non-deterministic Philip. Philip and Philip space. And you throw those arcs like that, should we be filling those in as complete circles, or is that because there's going to be some funky overlap? Well, well Neil's not here, so I stopped making bullseyes because he <laughs> said he wants. No, they're complete circles. So. And, I, and I'm actually going to fill more in, so I'm not making a big picture yet. I just want to fill in enough so that it makes sense today, and then we'll fill it in a little more. So when you talk about complexity theory, you're talking about problems that you can already solve that are for sure in the decidable area, and you're wondering about how much time and space they take to solve. So problems that are in here are in polynomial time, like checking if a list is sorted, like finding the shortest path between two nodes. Problems out here are problems that you can do in polynomial time, but you're allowed non-determinism. So if you remember what that's like from the algorithms class, you can guess stuff and then verify it in polynomial time. From this point of view, from this class point of view, it means that you can have a non-deterministic term machine that does it. So that means, <clears throat> imagine if you have to try something and then check that it works. Non-deterministically, you can have an arrow that tries all of them at the same time. So the question is, how do you determine how much time it takes for a non-deterministic Turing machine to run. We're going to talk about that because it's very intuitive. But before we do, I just want to remind you, how much time does it take for a regular Turing machine to run that's deterministic? It's the number of steps it takes for it to say yes or no. And that's the amount of time it takes. And let's say a particular Turing machine you know, has an infinite number of inputs. And for every single input, say of size n, the number of steps it takes is bounded by some constant times n squared then you'd say that the algorithm runs in order n squared, just like you do for programs. So you measure it the same way. But you can't say that a Turing machine runs in n squared on a particular input. That doesn't make any sense. Like if this input is 7 and the number of steps it takes is 49, it's true that that's n squared, but that doesn't mean that the whole algorithm runs in n squared because maybe you have another one of size 10 and that takes you know, 2 trillion steps. So to say that an algorithm runs in n squared or that a Turing machine runs in n squared, it's got to be something that works for every single string in the, in the input, not just the particular one. OK, so that's regular normal time. Space is not how many steps the Turing machine takes, but how many distinct cells on the tape it visits. So in general, if you use, say, n squared space, you have to have used at least n squared time, because you have to visit those places to write things there. So anytime you visit a cell, it takes at least one step. You can visit them a lot and go back and forth plenty, plenty of times and have your time be much more. But in general, polynomial space algorithms are going to contain polynomial time algorithms. Because anything that takes polynomial time also takes polynomial space. Okay? Because just doing that many ste steps uh, All the way around? Space problems also polynomial time. No, no. If you have an algorithm that runs in polynomial time, okay. then it takes yeah. polynomial space because it can't yep. because if it takes ten steps, then it's seen ten symbols. If it takes n squared steps, it seems at most n squared symbols. But it's possible to see n squared symbols on the tape and take much more than n squared time. Right, you can see n squared symbols in the tape and go back and forth an exponential number of times just visiting those symbols and writing different things in them. So polynomial space contains polynomial time. Things you can do in polynomial space are, there's more things you can do in polynomial space. So to say that an algorithm runs in n squared or that a Turing machine runs in n squared, it's got to be something that works for every single string in the, in the input, not just the particular one. OK, so that's regular normal time. Space is not how many steps the Turing machine takes, but how many distinct cells on the tape it visits. So in general, if you use, say, n squared space, you have to have used at least n squared time, because you have to visit those places to write things there. So anytime you visit a cell, it takes at least one step. You can visit them a lot and go back and forth plenty, plenty of times and have your time be much more. But in general, polynomial space algorithms are going to contain polynomial time algorithms. Because anything that takes polynomial time also takes polynomial space. Okay, Because just doing that many ste steps uh, all the way around. All the way around? 
space problem is also part of the time. No, no. If you have an algorithm that runs in polynomial time, okay. then it takes yeah. polynomial space because it can't. Yep. Because if it takes 10 steps, then it's seen 10 symbols. So if it takes n squared steps, it seems at most n squared symbols. But it's possible to see n squared symbols on the tape and take much more than n squared time. Right? You can see n squared symbols in the tape and go back and forth an exponential number of times just visiting those symbols and writing different things in them. So polynomial space contains polynomial time. Things you can do in polynomial space are, there's more things you can do in polynomial space intuitively than you can do in polynomial time. And we're going to talk about particular examples of these later. All right, so before we talk about any more about the relationship between these classes, let's talk more about this class in between. I haven't proved to you that it's in between. You know that it's bigger than p. I haven't shown you that it's really less than p space yet. We'll talk about that later. But for now, what does it mean to have the time of a non-deterministic algorithm? Here's the way to think of Turing machines from now on. Stop thinking of them in terms of these detailed, low-level you know, transition things. Think of them in terms of more abstract things that are easier to analyze. In particular, you're going to think of them in terms of graphs. An algorithm that's deterministic looks like this. It starts in the initial configuration of the machine, and then it goes to another configuration, and it goes to another, and it goes to a few more. And sooner or later, it stops and says yes, or it stops and says no. The computation of a deterministic machine looks like a straight line. Okay, and each of these dots is a snapshot of the machine. What does a computation of a non-deterministic machine look like? This is different. A non-deterministic machine starts here, and it might have more than one choice. So in order to represent this computation, we have to consider all the possible choices. And here's what it might look like. Let's say there's four choices. And let's say here there's two more choices, and out of this configuration there's only one choice, and out of this one there's three choices, and out of this one there's only one choice. And we keep going this way to new and newer configurations until sooner or later, one of these branches ends up at a state that says yes. Then we accept. A non-deterministic machine accepts its input if one set of these choices, if you can find your way from the initial configuration, work your way down through the tree and find one leaf at the bottom that says yes. What if there's a million leaves that say yes? That's OK, as long as there's one. What if there's a million that say no, that doesn't matter. As long as there's one, this machine accepts its input. So the accepting computation is still a line. It's a single line. But the whole computation possibilities is represented by a tree. Everyone understand the difference? OK. Is there a concept of? Um once you're at a length, uh, path of length b, there's no sense of going to b plus 1? Well, that's a good question. So that has to do with the question I was going to ask you next. How much time does it take to, to accept a string in a non-deterministic polynomial algorithm? How do you measure the time? Well, here it's obvious how you measure the time. You count the steps. How do you measure the time here? Well, what do you do? It's a definition, so there's no. I mean, there's a right answer, but it's arbitrary. We just decide how to measure the time here. The idea of a non-deterministic algorithm is that it gets all these choices ordered together, and it gets them for free. You can try them all, in some sense, at the same time. So it's getting, it's getting power for you. And the amount of time we actually measure is not the time it takes to look through this whole tree and find a yes on the bottom, but simply the time it takes to find one branch to the bottom. So this represents all your guessing for free. You guess this choice, you guess this choice, you guess this choice, and you just have to verify that it works. So the time it takes to run a non-deterministic algorithm is just the time it takes to get from the initial configuration to the place where you accept. Just the depth of this tree. Sure. Yeah. Why is the two-player game thing different then? Because isn't that just a tree also? It is a tree also, but the nodes don't connect with ors. Each level connects with an or, and then the next level connects with ands. But isn't it the same thing that I want to get to an accept state at the bottom? Yes. Let me get to it later. It's a good question, and it needs to be clarified, and I haven't clarified it yet, but I will get to it. So in this case, it's just one little branch that represents the computation. What if there were lots of different places to find yeses? then which one do we count as the time it takes to do that string? What if there was one that went down here, 